Welcome to the podcast. This is episode 94. That's a lot, 94. So it's good to have you. Um, good to have you joining us. Thank you. So I want to talk a little bit about the glory of privilege. In recent years, we have been told numerous times by numerous people to uh, check our privilege. We've um, we've seen phrases like white privilege or um, heteronormative privilege, that sort of thing, uh, dis, um, used dismissively. And I want to talk about just the very notion of privilege. In this uneven world, certain people are um, born ahead. Certain people have advantages over other people. Those advantages might be advantages of native intelligence, uh, musical talent, athletic talent, uh, born into a high socioeconomic class where they can afford good schools and whatnot. Uh, there are advantages, depending on what country you're, you're born into, advantages that come from being a, of a certain ethnic background and so on. Now, I think it's undeniable, uh, in fact, it is undeniable, that in this uneven world, some people are ahead and others are behind. Uh, everyone, it, it is not the case that everyone is equally well off. Uh, that's just simply false. Some people are poor. Some people are rich. Some people are intelligent. Some people are not intelligent. Uh, some people are beautiful. Some people are not uh, beautiful, and so on. And it's not as though uh, these standards are, uh, it's not as though some recording angel in the sky is keeping track of the differences, but that we don't know about them. No, uh, people are smarter, uh, smarter or taller or richer or whatever, according to our calculus, and, and things go better for the person uh, who has those advantages, everything else being equal. All right, so it is very much the case that certain people are privileged. Now, the, um, in, a, in a secular uh, framework, that constitutes a problem. Uh, so it is thought to be unfair or unjust that um, someone is privileged through, uh, someone is, uh, better yet, let's uh, approach it by saying someone is unprivileged or uh, underprivileged and all the disadvantages they have are theirs through, as we, as the phrase would go, through no fault of their own. They are um, underprivileged. Right? So this is assumed to be an injustice. It's assumed to be something that is just simply um, wrong, no matter what, because the, the very fact of the inequity is uh, thought to be unfair. Uh, and I think that this is uh, this assessment, our assessment that this is a problem, is the, is the problem. So I think we need to uh, start talking about um, the glory of privilege, or the value of privilege, or the um, blessing of privilege. And blessing is probably the the best way to express it, uh, although maybe the gift of privilege or the grace of privilege would be another good way. What do you have, Paul says, that you did not receive as a gift? And you, if you received it as a gift, why do you boast as though you did not? So as the saying goes, it, you don't want someone, for example, um, who was born, born on third base and who grows up believing he hit a triple. Um, being born on third base and hitting a triple are not the same thing. But the fact that some people in that privileged position make that mistake does not mean that being born on third base is an injustice to anybody. Um, God showers his kindness in unequal portions. And there's no way to object to this without objecting to God's providence, without objecting to the way God governs the world. So the issue, and, and we can see this in the parable of the talents. So um, the master goes away and leaves one guy with 10 talents and another guy with five talents and another guy with one talent. And the upshot of that story is the guy with the one talent, the underprivileged person, or the less, the less privileged person, 
thought he would play it safe and bury the talent in a napkin. And then at the end of the story, his talent is taken away and given to the one who has the most. Um, and it seems from this that the Lord Jesus uh, is not an egalitarian. He's not, uh, he's, he's not appealing to the same standard that we might want to appeal to. So the issue is not whether certain people are privileged. Of course they are. Uh, the issue is following the parable of the talents. What do they do with it? So let's say um, in a white majority country with the history that the United States has had, taking one thing with another, I think it's undeniable that whites taking, uh, we're taking an average here, we're not going head for head, but taking an average, there is such a thing as white privilege. That exists. Now, it seems that if we're thinking biblically, the thing that we should be asking such privileged whites to do is not check their privilege or not try to shake their privilege off or try to be embarrassed about their privilege or be ashamed of their privilege, but rather we should ask them to turn a profit on their privilege. How have you invested your privilege? How have you glorified the Lord? How have you uh, invested your privilege in such a way as to uh, love God and to love your neighbor? How have you used your privilege in a way that will advance the kingdom? Now, notice that this is a very different thing than, than saying, how have you used your white privilege to advance the cause of white privilege. That's, that's simply sandbagging. That's, that, that is doing something, you're doing something wrong where you're, you're thinking that the, you're making something that's not the standard into the standard. But if you said, uh, okay, if, let's say you've got a, a Christian, some Christian, who's beautiful, smart, uh, rich, well-connected, uh, it makes sense to ask why, why would she not use her privilege to advance the kingdom? Um, in the same way, any kind of privilege that we have ought to be used to advance the kingdom. We're not advancing the cause of whatever privilege it was. So a person who's beautiful doesn't use that beauty to advance the cause of beautiful people. But a person who is talented and so forth is the kind of person who ought to invest those talents in the cause of the kingdom. Use it to open doors. Use it to expand opportunities for the gospel. Use it to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. So, um, as we continue through episode 94 of our podcast, we come now to my book review section. And I decided to, um, in, in this podcast and in the next one, um, I wanted to review two different books about two different people from the same era, the same generation. And uh, both of these books, there's a personal connection. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, that. Uh, when uh, this book had a movie made about it a few years ago, and the book and the movie are called Unbroken. The book is by Laura Hillenbrand, Laura Hillenbrand, and it is the story of Lou Zamperini. Uh, Lou Zamperini was a uh, uh, young man on the eve of the Second World War, he, he fought in the war, was uh, um, acquitted himself courageously in the war. But before the war, he was an Olympian athlete and a runner, track, uh, track star, and uh, competed in the 1936 Olympics. The, those were the, um, uh, the Olympics in, in Berlin, where uh, Jesse Owen did his um, famous feat. So Lou, Lou Zamperini is a runner, and he's an internationally known uh, runner. When the wars and and he acquitted himself well uh, in those Olympics, uh, attracted some notice, and um, and after the but after the war started, he uh, he joined uh, the Army Air Corps. Uh, there was no Air Force at the, at the time, and he was uh, his plane was shot down in the Pacific. I'm collapsing a lot of uh, things here, and uh, he spent a long, long time. Uh, in an open raft on the Pacific and was finally eventually captured by the Japanese and then went through uh, a hellish experience as a, as a POW in uh, the, the Japanese uh, 
prisoner of war uh, system. Then uh, after the war, he is um, released. He was converted in the uh, uh, famous Billy Graham crusade in Los Angeles in 19. 19- 50. When Back when he was in the raft, he had promised God that if God got him out of this, he would, uh, he would live for him. His, um, after the war, he got married. Um, his he was, marriage was somewhat rocky. His wife got interested in um, the Christian faith, and she wanted him to go to the Billy Graham crusade. He winds up going and starts to storm out because he's under conviction. And then he had a vivid recollection of that promise he'd made back in the Pacific. Uh, Lou Zamperini is converted, and uh, and this book uh, g- goes through all of this information, uh, you know, all of this uh, in harrowing detail. After he's converted, he decides to go back to Japan to try to track down um, the the guards who had been responsible for him, so that he could share the gospel with them. So uh, he goes over to Japan to try to. Uh, present the gospel to the to the prison guards who had mistreated him, and um, so that's the the story. Uh, that that's the um, uh, story of Lou Zamperini, who just died in his nineties, uh, just a few uh, years ago. So the the book is well researched and well written. It's it's just um, very good. Uh, Hillenbrand does a very good job telling this story. I was interested in this because uh, growing up, well, I'll, I'll put it this way. Uh, my uh, parents, my, my dad particularly, were friends with uh, Lou Zamperini. So when uh, my mom was a missionary in Japan and my dad was a naval officer in uh, stationed there in the Korean War or uh, home ported out, uh, out of Japan in the Korean War. And when... Uh, Lou Zamperini came over to Japan. Uh, he met my dad in a Bible study. Uh, so there were not that many evangelicals in Japan at the time, and they were all probably pretty much in the same Bible study. Well, uh, my dad and Lou Zamperini became uh, friends. Uh, I won't go into all the details, but my uh, my dad wound up helping uh, Lou Zamperini uh, out and got him out of a jam. and they, So they became um they, they became friends. And so I grew up hearing Lou Zamperini stories. A number of the stories that were in this, uh, were in this book were, um, uh, were discussed or talked about as I was, um, as I was growing up. My dad saw, there's a episode where in the Berlin Olympics where uh, Zamperini swiped a, a swastika flag. And, um, my dad saw that flag in, his garage in California, and uh, there there is a uh, somewhere in our family's archives. There's a picture of me uh, as a baby uh, drooling adorably, uh, and that picture was taken by Lou Zamperini. So w- one of these days we're going to find that picture, and I'll post it online or something, so you can you all can see what a, a um, what a good photographer Zamperini was when he had a model subject. So, Unbroken by Lauren Hillenbrand, a uh, good book, a uh, really fine testimony to the power of God. God so, um, as we continue through uh, episode 94 of our podcast, uh, we've come to uh, our Hamartiological study, so our study of hamartiology, our study of sin. The word anapatoktos is used four times, and it's translated in the New Testament in various ways. One of the translations is disobedient, and it refers to the kind of behavior that Paul is talking about in the uses of the law, the use of the law uh, being that of civil restraint. It, it was not intended for righteous men who are already self-governed. Rather, the law was intended for the lawless and disobedient. We see that in 1 Timothy 1, 9. This use helps us to understand Paul's thought in Titus 1, where he is discussing elder qualifications. There he says that an elder candidate's children must not be rightly accused, um, 
of riot or that of being unruly. Unruly is the, dis- is the rendering of this same word. It comes up again just a few verses later. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. That's down in verse 10. So from this, it's clear that we are not saying that an elder is disqualified because he told his three-year-old son to eat his peas and the son decided not to. Uh, this qualification is referred to children who are simply out of control. They're, they're grown up and out of control. Interestingly, the same word is used one more time in Hebrews 2.8. God has subjected everything to Christ and has not left anything, quote, that is not put under him. In other words, as Christ's rule in this world is consolidated and made manifest, we will eventually see that nothing is disobedient. You've spent a pleasant half hour with podcast proprietor Douglas Wilson. This podcast is produced by Canon Press. Please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite listening platform. To hear more from Doug, please visit canonpress.com.